Good evening and welcome. Uh, my name is Louise Davidson Schmich. I'm a professor of political science here at the University of Miami. And the goal of the Deutschlandjahr program is to, um, at a time when there are a lot of people, both in the United States and Germany, talking about um, building walls and divisions among people, um, to try to work together to bring people together. Germans certainly have an experience of walls falling and positive effects. Um, as a result thereof, and I think this is the spirit in which this event is offered. Um, and so what we're trying to do over the course of the year is to highlight some things that the United States and Germany have in common. Um, we're countries that since the end of World War II have had a very productive partnership. We work together um, and brought about a level of peace and prosperity um, between our countries and within Western Europe that's really unprecedented. Um, the standards of living in our two countries are so high that literally people are dying to get into the countries that we live in. Um, and I think that we have uh, quite a bit in common and we can learn from each other. And so this roundtable series is designed to do exactly that, take issues where the United States and Germany have things in common and examine some of the common challenges that they face in the start of the 21st century. So this, our first round table, is one that looks at the issue of immigration um, and the challenges of uh, incorporating new immigrants into our respective societies. I am very, very happy to have um, a great lineup of people here, both from uh, the academy and outside the academy from diplomacy. Um, to talk about their experiences and their relative um, areas of expertise. And what I'll do is I'll introduce our panelists for you first, and uh, everyone's going to speak for about 10 minutes, and then we'll open it up to a question and answer session. When that's over, we have some delicious German food in the back, and we will soon be joined by two uh, undergraduate students from the University of Miami, a cellist and a violinist who will be playing Beethoven duos while we enjoy our drinks. Um, and the idea is that it's not just the round table, but it's also a networking reception. I can already see um, that the panelists up here have been exchanging business cards since they got here, and so I hope that will happen um, with members of the audience, too. Um, so our speakers tonight, I'll introduce them in order of them talking. Um, the first person we have is Dr. Claire Wieslady porter who is from the University of Miami Women's and Gender Studies program and the Department of Anthropology. And she's going to be talking about push factors. Why is it that people are leaving their countries and trying to come to places like the United States and Germany? Um, and she'll be followed by Dr. David Abraham, who is, um, are you a professor of law or a professor emeritus of law? I don't think he's very I'll, I'll emeritus. For the I, okay. For, for All right. Because he, ostensibly he told me he was emeritus, but then I kept seeing him around campus all the time. Um, and he's going to be talking about uh, U.S. and German citizenship laws. Then we have Felix Montañez, who is an attorney practicing asylum law um, before the Miami Asylum Office and the Miami Immigration Court. And he works for the Catholic Legal Services of the Archdiocese of Miami. And he's going to be talking about recent changes to the United States asylum law and their effects um, right here in Miami. Then we have Marcus Thiel, who is an associate professor at FIU in the Department of Politics and International Relations. He's also the director of the EU Jean Monnet Center of European and Eurasian Studies. But even more importantly than that, he is a University of Miami PhD. So he has connections to this university as well. And he'll be talking about the EU context um, in which uh, questions like asylum and refugees are debated um, in, in uh, Europe. Then we have uh, Annette Klein, who is the Consul General of the Federal Republic of Germany. And she'll be talking about Germans' experiences welcoming refugees. Um, and then finally, we have Jamie Scott, uh, Scotty Everett, who is the Director of Operations for the Refugee Assistance Alliance here in Miami. And she'll be talking about the experiences of Syrians who are coming um, to our community. And after everyone's spoken for about 10 minutes, then we'll open it up for some audience Q&A, and then we'll enjoy our German food. Um, so our first speaker will be uh, Dr. Wieslady Porter. I wanted to first talk about the scope of displacement. Um, and I don't want to throw too many numbers out there, um, but I will start with uh, a few numbers. 
So uh, according to the UN High Commissioner on Refugees, as of 2017, the number of people who were forcibly displaced reached a record rate of 44,400 people per day. Over the course of 2017, nearly 8.5 million were forced to move within their countries, almost twice as many as in 2016, um, and close to the record of 8.6 million people in 2014. Relatively new large-scale crises in the Democratic Republic of Congo that we don't really hear much about, um, and Burma, Myanmar, uh, along with the ongoing large-scale displacements from Afghanistan, Iraq, the Northern Triangle countries of Central America and Syria, caused a 2.9 million person increase in displaced persons in 2017. So we're reaching a total of 68.5 million displaced persons. So displaced persons leave their home areas due to violence, war, ecological catastrophe, and usually move somewhere within the country. As a case in point, preceding the Syrian refugee crisis in the early 2000s, many Syrian farmers were displaced by drought brought on by climate change. These climate migrants, migrants moved from rural areas into Syria's cities. Many eventually became part of the opposition to the Syrian Assad regime. So the UNHCR describes 2017 through the present time um, when many displaced faced, uh, as, a, as a time when many displaced um, faced deteriorating situations. Syria remains the country with the highest forcibly displaced population as of 2017. Uh, in March 2011, the Arab Spring movement began in Syria after the Assad regime kidnapped a boy from a demonstration that was actually a peaceful demonstration and tortured him to death before returning him to his family and clashes with government forces became more violent after that point. The Syrian people faced barrel bombs, nerve agents, and siege that continues to be used against civilians, especially in anti-regime areas. A barrel bomb is a drum filled with nails and explosives that's dropped out of a plane into a civilian neighborhood usually. Um, nerve agents have been reported to have been used against civilians, although denied usually by the regime. As of 2016, some 5.4 million Syrians have, made, have been uh, unable to flee because their cities are under siege. So siege is a, an old style of warfare um, where the city is basically surrounded by um, a hostile force and all the supply lines are cut off, the aid is cut off, et cetera. Um, for example, in the city of East Aleppo, food and other supplies were cut off by government forces and people in the city slowly starved. Those Syrians who have the means fled to more stable areas within Syria, and 5.1 million have so far fled from Syria to neighboring Lebanon, Jordan, and Turkey. Many Syrian men have fled to avoid participating in violence. Many fled to avoid serving in the Syrian army and also wanted to avoid the extremist groups who commandeered anti-regime militias, including Daesh, um, or as it's commonly known, ISIS or ISIL. Um, things have become especially challenging from 2017 into our present in terms of refugees and, and displaced people. Uh, the Northern Triangle countries from north of uh, Central America, El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala experience some of the highest rates of violence in the world. So El Salvador has the world's highest murder rate and Honduras has the second highest. Yet an enduring myth promoted by certain interests in the US is that migrants from the Northern Triangle are economic migrants seeking more opportunities and that such a motivation makes them less worthy of refugee status. Um, and that is to say that economic violence um, tends not to be taken as seriously. Many of these people are fleeing poverty, but poverty is related to the control of resources by gangs, elite family militias, and government violence. So people are trying to get their children out of harm's way, especially teenagers, teenage boys who may be forced to join gangs or tortured um, or, or even killed if they refuse, um, uh, and especially young women who, who risk a, a sexual violence. Um, this is directly related to the over 173,000 unaccompanied or separated minors who've arrived at the U.S. border over the last uh, several years. So as we speak, um, and many of you may be following this, there's, there's a caravan of people who's been walking from Hon Honduras nearing the Mexico border. Um, uh, these walking people are determined to reach the U.S. border to apply for asylum, and they're uh, facing Mexican government troops. Um, President Trump was infuriated by a similar caravan last April, 
um, that reached the U.S., and he's demanded that Mexico stop these people on the, the current uh, caravan, so we're kind of waiting to see what happens. So uh, another thing is gender-based violence is also a motivating factor in many women's decisions to flee the Northern Triangle countries. In El Salvador, as of 2017, a woman is murdered every 18 hours. The majority of these killings are committed by men um, in their lives. In June 2018, Attorney General Jeff Sessions made it virtually impossible for asylum seekers to gain asylum based on a claim that they're f uh, fleeing domestic abuse. Sessions reversed an immigration appeals court ruling that granted asylum to a Salvadoran woman who said she'd been sexually, emotionally, and physically abused by her husband. He termed this, Jeff Sessions uh, termed this to be private violence, unworthy of asylum. Um, and he, he also uh, said that fleeing from gang violence, gang violence was also private violence. Um, it is the rendering of an epidemic of violence against women as a private matter that has uh, uh, denied the public problem in many societies, including our own, though. Um, so there are also ongoing uh, uh, new displacement crises, and really there, there's so much that I'm, I'm just trying to limit it to the 10-minute the limit here. Um, uh, I'll address the Democratic Republic of Congo first. Um, it has the largest, uh, uh, th the third largest displaced uh, population um, as of right now. Um, it, the ongoing fighting between political factions um, and uh, 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 groups that have become violent over um, the, the elections that were supposed to happen that haven't, um, and militias in, in localized areas um, target women for sexual violence to terrorize villagers into fleeing, um, and this continues. Um, the internally displaced population uh, doubled to 4.4 million as of 2017. So far, over 620,000 Congolese have fled to neighboring countries. As the situation continues to be dire in DRC, it is likely many more people will flee to surrounding countries, uh, and, and this is most of all Uganda. So Uganda is already the, the um, uh, third in the world in terms of the number of refugees it hosts, and it receives on average 500 new refugees per day at this point. Um, so. Uh, so many experts have said that what's happening in the DRC, in terms of the scale of the crisis, is uh, on a par with um, some of the uh, refugee crises in, uh, and displacement crises in the Middle East. Um, but it, it just doesn't get as much attention, and, and there's a lot of discussion about why that is. Um, and then moving to um, uh, Burma, Myanmar. So in 2017, the UNHCR identified the Rohingya as the world's fastest growing refugee uh, group. Um, so Burma, Myanmar's mistreatment of the Rohingya is, not, is, is certainly not new. They're a stateless group whose ethnic, ethnicity is not counted in the Burmese census uh, and who are denied citizenship status. So it is uh, during the present decade that government forces and religious forces have attacked the Rohingya in an ethnic cleansing campaign um, that they actually call a, a something, they use the word cleaning in the, uh, in the actual terminology. While Bangladesh, as host to the world's largest refugee camp, it's actually uh, nicknamed the Mega Camp, has been praised for its treatment of the Rohingya refugees, as in other parts of the world, the burden for hosting refugees falls disproportionately on poor developing nations who need additional resources to host the increasing numbers of refugees. So the other thing about Bangladesh is that it's hit by seasonal monsoons and frequent cyclones. And this year's have caused flooding and landslides in exactly the area where the, this mega camp and, and most of the other camps are. Uh, so that's been um, a catastrophe for a lot of um, refugees as well. The seasonal storms have worsened due, due to human-made climate change, and this leaves these refugees even more vulnerable um, to what UNHCR has called catastrophic weather events. Uh, so, in, in terms of what's, uh, what's happening in, in Syria, um, uh, and this is, this is going on right now, is that the Syrian refugees in Lebanon, Jordan, and Turkey are, are seen as taxing the local economies, and they're easy to scapegoat for ethnic and political strife. Um, and as of this year, Lebanon began evicting Syrian refugees who were living in camps um, and evicting them uh, to, to flee back to Syria. Jordan has deported hundreds of Syrian refugees back to Syria this year without any advance notice or any kind of option for people to contest the decision. So proposed changes in UN guidelines governing which Syrians are eligible for protection may be used to increase the number 
deported to Syria. Um, uh, the UNHCR has not yet shared details of these uh, changes publicly. So there's fear that the proposed changes would allow host countries to send Syrians back across the border. Since June, there have also been some 20,000 spontaneous returns by Syrians from Jordan or Lebanon back to Syria. The primary reason reported is the grinding poverty of their lives abroad. Um, along with poverty, there's the precarity of their residency status there. Um, some parents are reportedly not sending their children to school for fear their expired residency papers would be reason to detain or deport their children without the parents' knowledge. So one of the common threads here in a lot of these stories is the fear of children being displaced or uh, removed from their their parents um, and their parents not having knowledge. Um, um, and this, this is uh, very much part of the uh, global crisis uh, right now, so. Thank you very much. So now we have a sense of what's driving people to leave and David will talk about some of the regulations that have guided um, people arriving and living in other societies like the United States and Germany. Well, I'm going to do something of that sort. Ten minutes is about how long it takes an academic to ask a question about an immigration and integration regime in two different countries rather than to actually describe them. So I'm going to limit my remarks to the, about the United States to about three sentences, and then I will um, make three points about Germany, one about the breakdown of the international regime established after 1945. Secondly, about the fact that Germany is an immigration country already and has been for quite some time. And third, that it needs an immigration law that would both make possible both Forderin and Förderin the uh, immigration to and integration into Germany. So first as to the United States. The United States has approximately one million immigrants a year, two thirds of them selected on the basis of family connection. This is a great irritant to the current administration, and one-third on the basis of job skills. Uh, no one country may take more than 7% of that quota, which is why large countries like China and India uh, have a much longer waiting list than, say, uh, Norway, which is our presumptive target pool <laughs> these days. Um, this was not always so. The system was developed uh, in the civil rights period and replaced one based on national origins, which was an attempt to keep the country uh, first Protestant and then at least Christian, uh, and then finally at least white. Uh, each of those uh, walls, so to speak, uh, has weakened over time. Okay, I'm not gonna say anything more about the United States, except to say that uh, the putative success of immigrant integration in the United States has a lot to do with the fact that we have a very weak welfare system and low levels of social solidarity. So we don't help anybody out uh, who's already here, and we're certainly not going to help out anybody who comes here and uh, we let the market sort that out. We call that the land of opportunity. Uh, other people call it you know, the most free market capitalist society in in the, the Northern Hemisphere. Okay, uh, that was more than three sentences, but you won't get any more. Now, uh, Germany. Um, first of all, um, the great shock of the 2015 migrations of nearly one million people into Germany and through the Schengen system uh, was a shock of the sort that it was because it violated the presumptions that were generated by the UN treaties that followed World War II. Namely, that there are three kinds of people on the move. There are refugees who are seeking refuge during a storm and whose intention is to return to the place whence they came once that storm is over. And in the interim, they are to be taken care of by the United Nations. Sometimes that storm lasts a very long time. So we see, for example, that Palestinian refugee camps are the situ, are the locale, the venue, for the longest running people waiting, seeking refuge during a storm. Some storms never end, right? Um, Others uh, are more transient. Um, a good portion of my family was in a refugee camp, was in refugee camps after World War II, uh, and the goal was that they would return, or if they couldn't return, that they would move on to an assortment of different places. The second leg of that 
post-World War II system uh, was asylum. An asylum seeker is someone who is already in your country and things happen in their home country and they can't go back. Or they are at the border of your country and asking to be let in uh, because things have gone to hell uh, in their home country. And then you can choose to let them become one of you or not. The one thing that the treaties post-World War II insisted upon was that you not return them to a place where they will be persecuted. The term used is the French term non refoulement That was the only obligation. And then there was a third group called migrants. This seems, from uh, the previous speaker has said, to be the largest and most important group. But this was not so. Take yourself back to the days of the Cold War. The Iron Curtain did a lot of good things, one of which was it kept people where they were. From the standpoint of this system, I'm not making a moral evaluation here. Uh, it kept people where they were. Transportation was expensive. Communication was nothing like what it is now. And um, there was migration, but it didn't take these kind of massive marching flows in the Cold War period. After 1990, and with the simultaneous development of cheap airfares and easy transportation and communication, uh, this situation started to change. Um, but it's not as if the Bundesrepublik uh, stood still uh, during uh, this period. Um, it tried to adapt to the system. We got the Schengen system of open borders within Europe, combined with the Dublin Protocols, which indicated that someone who wanted to come into the EU had to make their case at their first port of entry. Uh, we see that in the case of Italy, Greece, et cetera. Uh, that was one of the core issues in, in uh, Chancellor Merkel's decision to suspend Dublin in a, an emergency situation. And probably that very decision is the leading cause of the AfD's uh, emergence and success. Uh, these decisions were always political, leaving, living here in what, Miami. We know that every Cuban who was looking for a better life was dubbed a political refugee because of the miserable status of U.S.-Cuban uh, relations, whereas every Haitian who was looking for a better life was dubbed an economic migrant. So the advice to Haiti that I, for one, tried to give people advising Haiti for a long time was that they needed to get themselves a communist government so that uh, migrants from Haiti would be treated with dignity instead of with disdain. Uh, alas, they didn't do that. Um, OK, so the Dublin and Schengen system work as long as that's the world we live in. Once migrant flows uh, uh, expand, uh, we're out of that world. And we've seen the Schengen, Dublin, UN treaties world collapse in front of us. But um, Germany has had a large number of ersatz mechanisms operating as an immigration regime since 1945. First of all, the massive numbers of Germans who came from Soviet lands to overwhelmingly West Germany, not East Germany, to West Germany. Second, after 1990, and continuously a kind of diaspora ingathering of Germans from Eastern Europe, from the Euro, as far away as the Urals, etc. Then, of course, millions of Turkish peasants who became Gastarbeiter at a time when the mines and steel mills had a limitless appetite for unskilled labor. That was a quite easy thing uh, to do. Um, and you know we have the stories uh, of uh, from Max Frisch and others about how what we wanted to import was labor power, but as Karl Marx once told us, labor is a unique commodity in that the producer of the commodity can't be separated from the commodity. So you can import a million Chinese television sets and not a single Chinese person, but if you're going to import labor, you're stuck with the people. Um, so. Um, uh, that was another uh, major source. Then, of course, we have internal EU migration, right? So the fact is that 20% of the German population does not hold a German passport okay, today. Uh, and um, uh, I'm compressing this. There are issues about the ability to naturalize, the liberalization of German naturalization laws, which took place quite late uh, in this story. Uh, the introduction of EU solely birth on the soil for those who had long-term residence uh, uh, permits, uh, a, a rather late development. But migration continued during uh, this time. 
Uh, so we have nearly 4% of the population is of Turkish origin. 3 million Germans have a Turkish immigrant parent. Um, the continued inflow of, uh, of more docile country girls as wives for Turkish men instead of the uppity German-Turkish women. Um, um, I, I, I say this, but it's true. I mean, this is a, not only a discursive truth, this is a behavioral uh, truth. Um, so in addition, there are 575,000 Italians, 680,000 Poles, 340,000 Greeks, 360,000 Romanian citizens living and working in Germany. And those are just the top five, right? Eight other EU countries have at least 200,000 of their citizens uh, living and working in Germany. Uh, in addition, there were a couple of special programs uh, for Jewish citizens of the former Soviet Union that added another immigrant wave that none of these people are considered immigrants, right? But they all arrive and function as immigrants in the society. In addition, uh, for historical and other reasons, Germany had a very generous a constitutionalized asylum uh, requirement and an asylum acceptance rate, which along with Sweden were the two highest in the, in the world, twice the US level of asylum acceptances. Uh, so, um, and even those who are denied asylum uh, were beneficiaries of a policy of duldung. So in 2014, for example, there were 100, this is before the great wave, there were 130,000 people denied asylum uh, in Germany and who did not leave. Uh, they were able to enter the market mostly after three months compared to one year in France and the UK to receive health benefits. Um, and uh, to get three month renewals, so called Kettenduldung, um, so that deportations didn't happen. Okay. This was not something that prior to 2015 generated a lot of political animus or hostility uh, in Germany. There was a certain um, resentment, but it was really with the influx of a million people in 2015 that the whole system. Uh, toppled. Um, there are other things, including subsidiary protection uh, of Article 33, an EU directive of 2004, uh, which offered five years of indefinite uh, residence uh, to people who are not uh, directly targets of persecution. Um, at any rate, I, I could go on. The point is that Germany has the notion that Germany is not an immigration country is not only belied by the fact that millions of Germans have Polish names, um, uh, dating from 19th century and earlier migrations and border changes, but in fact, the Bundesrepublik, both Bonn and Berlin, uh, have been immigrant countries all along. But using these ersatz mechanisms, including asylum, to the point where asylum becomes discredited as the institution for which you originally intended. And we begin arguing very fruitless arguments that only the right wing can win about whether economic displacement is persecution and what the people of the North owe the South and what the poorest people in your own country should give up for the benefit of people in Honduras or Afghanistan. And this is leaving aside issues you know, of religious and, and racial uh, difference. So, um, how much time do I have left, Louise? Um, you're about done. I'm about done. All right, well then, I will make my recommendation in a very compact form. Um, Germany needs an immigration uh, law, a real immigration regime. Um, it could be modeled on Canada's. Canada gets a lot of good press that it doesn't deserve. The Canadian immigration system is a totally mercantilist system that measures human capital values, how much education you have, how much money do you have, uh, uh, et cetera, and then uh, allots uh, visas accordingly. It's very mercantilist, very unprogressive. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, the fact is, if Germany, with 81 million people, accepted 300,000 immigrants per year, I take the number 300,000, it would fall somewhere between Canada, which with 35 million accepts 250,000 a year, and the US, which with 318 million 
accepts about one million a year, and I'm talking only about legal migration, only about legal migration. For an immigration regime to work on that scale, however, will require to be successful serious integration efforts. For many years, this was another topic totally avoided in Germany. The left used the term multiculturalism to mean leave those people alone, they're going to leave anyway, so why try and make them be like us? We're pretty terrible people. Um, and the right uh, used that logic to say, well, they're going to leave, so we don't have to do anything for them anyway. So the, the notion of multiculturalism um, was very, to use a German word, instrumentalized politically to an extraordinary extent by all parties. That's not possible anymore. So then we got the light culture debate, uh, whether there is a single, you know, if you want to be friendly, light culture means mainstream culture. If you want to be unfriendly, it means uh, uh, really all the worst of Germany uh, rolled into one. Um, and that debate um, leads to questions like, does Islam belong to Germany, about which we've gotten yes, no, maybe answers from different political forces, but no serious conception of what integration would mean the extent to which German society can and would become more pluralist if it recognized immigration more explicitly and tried to further integration more substantially, tried to see whether you could have a successful welfare state in a heterogeneous, in a society marked by considerable heterogeneity. It is an unfortunate truth that most strong welfare states are in relatively homogeneous societies, Denmark, Sweden, etc. cetera. Um, but Germany has a deeply institutionalized welfare state. Maybe it could survive the recognition of multiplicity and pluralism in the society. At any rate, we won't know the answers to any of that unless immigration is uh, taken up as a real uh, uh, agenda item, uh, not just an occasional blue card for a highly super talented Indian IT uh, specialist, but as a systematic process uh, focused on the upper and the lower ends uh, of the labor force, as is the case in most other countries. So I've gone past my time, but we'll talk more later. Thank you. Now we'll hear um, the story on this side of the pond with um, Felix Montañez talking about recent changes in um, U.S. law. Good evening. Uh, my name is Felix Montanez, and I'm an attorney with Catholic Legal Services. Uh, I'm going to try to keep it practical in terms of uh, what actual asylum practitioners uh, face when they are going to the asylum office or going to immigration court. But I did want to give some background. I'm not going to talk about German law at all because I'm not familiar with it. But um, I do know that the post-World War II order, um, there are some commonalities in U.S. and Western Europe. Uh, namely that in the uh, 1951 Refugee Convention, the definition of a refugee um, is mirrored in different ways in different countries. So the definition is, uh, paraphrasing it, uh, persons who have a well-founded fear of persecution, and uh, it's specifically on account of mem uh, either membership in a race, religion, nationality, uh, political opinion, or membership in a social group. Uh, so that actually, um, it narrows the uh, scope of who's eligible for asylum quite a bit because there are many people who are facing life and death situations who will not, uh, under any uh, legal theory, be, uh, be persecuted on account of their uh, membership in a race, nationality, social group, etc. So you can imagine, for example, somebody who's facing extortion threats in their home country. If the reason why they're being persecuted is because the, uh, the perpetrator of the crime is trying to get money, then that would not be a qualifying ground to get asylum. And so we actually have a lot of cases like that where people are fleeing extortion threats from uh, criminal organizations and from um, various uh, elements in their societies. So um, I want to start what off with that uh, paraphrase definition of refugee because, um, as you can imagine, race, religion, nationality are controversial uh, categories in themselves, but a particular social group is uh, a very nebulous one. And you can imagine that a lot of the uh, controversy around asylum law 
has to do with who are these particular social groups, uh, which ones are cognizable, that's what, the term we use uh, under U.S. law, and uh, that has been a topic of much discussion. And actually, a lot of the panelists uh, prior to me, the two panelists prior to me, actually touched on some of the subjects, uh, including the fact that there was a recent decision this year uh, that uh, substantially changed um, how that's going to work. So um, I want to talk about first a case called ARCG. ARCG is the, uh, that's the initials of the immigrant, or the uh, respondent in that case. Uh, it was a woman from Guatemala, and she had, um, we have a little bit of a brief summary of the facts. I'm not going to repeat it here, but uh, basically it was a very extreme domestic abuse situation. And um, our office personally, Catholic Legal Services and other nonprofits, we deal with uh, people who have gone through trauma like this very often. And um, the, the problem is not only the domestic abuse, but the fact that the governments of those countries are so weak uh, or so um, they're acquiescent in the abuse that there's no way for them to relocate and flee from the abuse. So if a woman is a victim of domestic violence, she tries to relocate to the capital, well, the husband comes after her in the capital, makes a police report, the police report is ignored, police say, no, it's a domestic matter, it doesn't matter. Um, it's, it's something that should be taken care of at home, at home and not by the government. And that's, that's fairly common, fairly routine. Um, and Guatemala is, is one example of, of a country where um, oftentimes the police reports will not lead to anything. Um, so this case actually came about uh, because uh, uh, in Guatemala, uh, the government actually, in this case, uh, it came to the Board of Immigration Appeals. So there's immigration courts. Once the immigration judge decides on the case, there's a level of appeal above him, the Board of Immigration Appeals. And they were the ones who decided this case in 2014. Um, the uh, decision, uh, it's actually very interesting because one of the things that it was a cause for criticism later was that the Department of Homeland Security, which is the government in that case, the prosecutor, they actually stipulated a lot of the facts, um, which uh, later on became a problem. They actually said, uh, well, actually, we agree that married women in Guatemala who are unable to leave their relationships is a particular social group. This is 2014, so a different administration. Um, and it makes a very big difference. Uh, so they, they stipulated a lot of the key facts in this case. And uh, because of it, I can say um, my, I've had cases that I have won because of, uh, because of this precedent. Um, people in my office, uh, I know personally of dozens of cases that have uh, been granted because of this precedent that was set. Because we could go to the immigration judge and say, you must follow the law, which uh, changed officially after years and years of advocacy in 2014. It was a major victory. And um, it disproportionately affected Central American claims. Because um, let's say the standard political asylum claim would be um, somebody who has a political opinion, uh, who is against the government and is being persecuted by the government. Um, but there also are asylum claims where the persecutor is not the government. It's actually a private actor, and the government is either unwilling or unable to stop the private actor. So um, this, this case uh, was, was a very groundbreaking uh, precedent. And I, I have a couple slides also just showing some statistics. I'm not going to dwell on them too much. but. Um, I think the key thing here is this from 2016, um, is that El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras are in the top 10. Um, that's not uh, indicative of their populations. They're relatively small countries. They are close to the US, but um, they are a, uh, a large number of the asylum seekers here. Of course, we did touch on this earlier. There's a difference between refugees and asylum seekers in, in, in our law. Um, but we're talking about people, uh, when we say asylum seekers, people who um, are present in the United States and oftentimes there'll be people who overstayed a visa or entered without inspection or even presented themselves at a border, uh, at, a, at a port of entry and requested asylum there. They are people who are already in the country and there are two ways that they can, be, they can apply for asylum. They can either request it in front of an immigration judge um, if they're in proceedings, uh, if they're being deported, and they can file a defensive asylum. It's called a defensive asylum. Or they can apply affirmatively. So they send an application to an agency um, and then they get an interview. So this is uh, some stats about that. So affirmative asylum is when people um, submit an application directly to uh, the United States Citizenship and Immigration Service, which is the agency that um, deals with what's called affirmative asylum, um, people who are not in deportation proceedings. And there are some stats here. This is from a few years ago, so uh, I want to give a little bit of a picture. Even, even then, 
Um, there was a very high representation of El Salvador, Guatemala, and, and Honduras, which are most of my clients are from those countries. And um, this is not entirely uh, going to be uh, indicative of how nice Californians are or New Yorkers or Floridians. Um, it's just uh, the fact that because different applicant pools are going to exist in each state, right? But um, there are interesting statistics, though, that, that you could look at uh, in terms of the grant rates of different immigration judges. And we have a very free society here. We have a Freedom of Information Act. I can actually look at a judge and, and see what his percentage of asylum grants was in a given year. And I can see that if I have this judge, I have a 3% chance of getting my asylum granted. But if I have this other judge, I have a 90% chance. So um, that's what we call the asylum roulette. Um, any person who practices asylum law can tell you that there's so much uh, variation in how asylum claims are dealt with depending on the personality, disposition of the adjudicator, of the asylum officer, or of the judge. So um, unfortunately, I know that if I have a detained case, I'm going to not mention any names, but if I have a detained case in Pompano Beach, uh, people who are in they're, it's, not a, it's not called a jail, but they're called inmates. Um, if I have one of the two judges in Pompano Beach, I have a very low possibility of getting bond, very low possibility of winning my claim. If I can get the person out on bond, my chances skyrocket of getting their claim granted. Because even though the law is the same, the judge adjudicating the case is going to be different, and I'll have a much better opportunity to present my case. So um, while these don't reflect necessarily this, the uh, uh, doesn't reflect necessarily that New York, California are objectively better than other states. Um, I think you would see that, um, for example, the immigration courts, this is actually about affirmative asylum, but you'll see that immigration courts, for example, in different states have different grant rates and uh, very drastically different grant rates. And this is another statistic about um, affirmative versus defensive. I'm just going to skip here. Um, OK, so uh, the change that happened this year was touched on. Uh, uh, earlier, and it uh, was in reference to the uh, new case matter of AB. It's, it's because there's a very special provision um, in our law that I, I had mentioned that before the Board of Immigration Appeals had decided a case, and that set a precedent in 2014 that we were able to use successfully. Well, the current Attorney General, Jeff Sessions, um, is using this power uh, where he's able to certify a case to himself. So let's say that appeal goes up to the Board of Immigration Appeals. He can certify the question to himself and say, I want to decide this case. And he issued a very lengthy decision. And he said that um, ARCG was wrongly decided. That's the prior case granting domestic abuse uh, survivors a pathway to asylum. Um, he said, and, and this is almost like laser targeted to Central Americans. Because as I said, it's often the government is not the persecutor. It's private actors. So uh, AR, the uh, new case AB basically says that private criminal activity constitutes a, does not constitute a uh, particular social group. And so uh, it makes it much, much more difficult to win um, an asylum claim if it's just domestic abuse. And it's actually very heartbreaking. Um, I'll tell you from a personal level uh, that I have clients who we took under contract and said, you have a very good case. And the case comes out that totally uh, makes it a bad case now. And so we have to tell them, listen, uh, this case came out. And now what was a really strong claim is now a very weak claim. And so um, often that, that can be very difficult. Um, so. Uh, right, it's, it's very difficult also to know what the um, what the remedy is because he actually legally does have the authority to uh, to rescind the prior uh, precedent. Um, but he, he and also he took uh, exception to the fact that the government in the prior case stipulated all of these things. So he said, "Oh well, this was really a cursory analysis. They weren't actually looking at the facts of the case closely enough." He called into question whether the person was actually a domestic violence victim. There's a lot of it, it's it was actually uh, very thoroughly. Uh, dismantling uh, or trying to dismantle uh, the, the prior precedent, and now um, we don't have much of a leg to stand on with these cases. Uh, one of the interesting things about uh, defensive asylum uh, is that there's been an increase. Uh, well, if this is a very natural result of the fact that there's an, an increase in enforcement of, uh, of detention of people within the country. Um, I can tell you that prior to uh, this administration, there were a set of priorities that was created in the, the second term of uh, Obama. And it basically said that if you uh, 
if you had been here, uh, if you weren't a recent arrival, you didn't have a criminal record, and you met certain criteria, that you weren't a priority for enforcement. That didn't mean you had a pathway to status. It just meant that if you ended up in deportation proceedings, they could potentially close the case and not remove you. Well, uh, one of the first things that happened with the change of administration was that uh, they got rid of all the priority lists, so everybody is a priority. Um, but what, what does that mean? Well, actually, one of the interesting things is that a lot of people are getting into proceedings, going before an immigration judge, um, and so more asylum applications are being filed with the, with the immigration court. Um, our U.S. law is uh, basically has a one-year filing deadline for asylum, so you have to file within one year of having arrived in the country. Uh, however, uh, there are certain exceptions, like if there's changes of circumstance. Um, so let's say somebody who's been here for 10 years gets picked up uh, in the past you know, a few months, um, they may be able to file an asylum claim based on new circumstances in the country. And then there's also something called uh, withholding of removal, which uh, is not quite as beneficial as, as asylum, but it'll stop the deportation. Uh, and this is kind of a little, a little bit beyond the ken of, of what I, I was talking about, but obviously, um, there's been a dramatic reduction, not just in, uh, not just in uh, the uh, asylum grants for uh, people who are here, but um, there's been a reduction in the number of refugees being admitted into the country. So, um, whereas, uh, you know, some country like Turkey or Lebanon has admitted, you know, millions of, of people to their to their country, um, we have a trickle. We had a trickle before. We had a trickle with 94,000 approximately in 2016, and it's gone down to 29,000. Um, which, given the size of the country, is uh, is very a very small percentage, or, uh, and and so naturally the uh, the effect on this of uh, this on Florida has been there's there's been a slowdown in refugee arrivals within the state, which is because na nationwide there's been fewer refugees that that have been admitted. So in Florida, uh, there's also been fewer refugees um, that have been entering into the country uh, into, into the state uh, through the agencies, and. Um, I would just say, uh, I tried to time it at 10 minutes, but I'm not sure if I'm over or not. But I, I would just say that, uh, yeah, I think probably the biggest thing you'll hear from asylum practitioners, people that actually go to court and file applications for asylum, um, is uh, the great degree of uh, arbitrariness in, in the proceedings. Um, the fact that if I know the officer, I have a better idea of my approval chances than the, the strength of the case objectively. Um, and so that's something that can be a, a very a big cause of stress and uncertainty for people. Um, and also there's been other changes that we could talk about during the question and answer uh, period. Uh, there are other humanitarian protections for people aside from asylum, uh, but there's been a, a kind of narrowing of the possibility of getting asylum, especially for the clientele that I've been serving. story from the other side of it, the Atlantic, where Marcus Thiel will be talking about the situation in the EU. Hello, thank you. Thank you very much, Luis, for inviting me and for organizing um, this wonderful series. I'm glad to be back at my alma mater. But um, in the few minutes that I have, trying to get under 10 minutes, I want to basically highlight some of the major differences. As you know, and as we just heard, um, the, uh, the US, of course, is a sovereign country, whereas in the EU or even Germany, Germany is embedded in the European Union. And that brings all kinds of complexity, so, which I try to point out now in a few minutes. Um, and just in case um, you were not quite aware or up to date, um, this is the EU of, of today and um, sort of the various countries show you basically the age of when um, individual countries exceeded, sort of with the core Europe and then um, you have um, here the newer member states as we still call them that exceeded in 2004. Um, now, Schengen. Uh, Schengen was already mentioned by um, David Abraham, and that is very important because sh the Schengen, uh, Schengen is the borderless travel agreement. And um, so that has suffered quite a bit, as was pointed out already earlier, um, because of the fact that technically a refugee um, that would um, go to the, uh, to the European Union area, according to the Dublin regulation, would have to apply for asylum in the first country in which it sets its food, foot in. That, however, in practice does often not happen for a variety of reasons, right? And so um, individual countries now have started to actually um, monitor the borders once again, uh, which is uh, kind of sad if you ask me. But um, talking about, yeah, give me a second. Here, uh, I want to also show you a little bit. However, we are not quite 
at the same level that immigration pressures have in reality succeeded. In 2014, 2015 and 2016, we received much higher numbers. For example, this is just a snapshot from the first half of 2015 um, from The Economist. So um, if you roughly calculate the numbers together, you see in the first six months of 2015 about um, 350,000 um, migrants, it's called the migrants, reached um, the EU area, right? Compare that to the first half of 2018. If you calculate that together, that's not even 100,000. So what I'm trying here to tell you that um, through a variety of policy measures, um, through readmission agreements, through the returning of um, um, not uh, recognized asylum seekers, the, and through, of course, the emergence of the far right, which had some sort of symbolic effect, um, the, stri the st more strengthening of uh, asylum regulations, because it is still um, national sovereignty and the European Union has just framework regulations. Through all of these measures, the numbers have really dropped. Um, well, this is just very quickly, but I'm not even going to go, um, except that uh, to note that in the past, um, in 2015, if you look at that number, we had the, let me just go back here. We had here the Eastern Mediterranean route, and that was the one in which many uh, would-be refugees would have gone through Turkey and then moved on to um, Greece and then through the Balkans into the other Schengen area states. Whereas now that focus has shifted according to the numbers to the Central Mediterranean route here in which Italy in particular has been quite, um, quite affected, um, also Spain to some extent. But I mean, if you wonder why some of these uh, rather um, aside from the from the government that Italy now has, right? Um, they really have a, a tremendous increase in um, demographic pressures and asylum pressures, and they don't feel that the European Union is helping them out enough. Um, and so, also, whereas um, in previous years we received more Syrians and also Iraqis and Afghanistan, um, nowadays, in particular, the ones that arrive in Italy, more of more than 50% of them are in fact from sub-Saharan African countries, which usually have lesser chance of getting asylum, and um, therefore, of course, the whole discourse about sort of economic migrants wanting to trying to improve their their um, lot has taken over there. Now. Um, I'm not going to go over the definitions, we went over this. This just to quickly show you here um, that, as I said earlier, in 2017, the number of people that applied for asylum in the EU has dropped 44%. So the, immigration, the migration or the political pressures have also um, been reduced with that. And of the 175,000 Syrians granted international protection in the EU, 70% received it in Germany, which also is quite interesting to note. Um, in, but one of the problems that uh, is that we have seen is that many of the ones that are supposed to return, in fact, do not return for a variety of reasons. In part because um, while they're not supposed to enter into another Schengen country, they can do so. Um, unless they're being stopped at the border, which is why we see no increase in border controls. But about half of them that are ordered to return home actually do not return home. And that has, of course, also you know, produce some political consequences in terms of the, the rise of the far right in many European states that we have seen. Think of the French elections in 2017. At the end of 2017, we have seen the far right in uh, Austria, right, taking over the government. And we have another couple um, elections coming up, um, which are quite difficult to manage there. Now, a little bit about what the Europeans are actually thinking. Um, according to the 2017 Eurobarometer poll, which is a EU-wide poll um, conducted by the European Commission, the European Union Executive, 73 3% of Europeans still want the EU to do more to manage the situation because it is seen as an EU-wide problem. I mean, there's, no, there's a reason why we call it the European refugee crisis and not the German one or the, the Italian one only. In Germany, um, there was another poll that recently came out. 37% are confident that Germany can master the, the huge take-in of particular 2015 and 2016. 32% um, are not so confident. Don't ask me about the other, the, the remainders. Um, sorry, I can't, oh, and um, just the picture here on top shows you sort of the distribution of the asylum seekers across EU member states. And as you can see here, Sweden, um, proportionately to the population, took in most. But um, Germany, being quite an orange, also took in quite a big number. And then you have um, Austria and Hungary. 
And if you think about again now the political effects of that, right? Austria having a far right government and Hungary under um, Orban um, very vehemently um, going against sort of any type of um, solution to the uh, refugee crisis. This slide is a little bit outdated, it's from 2014, but um, well, I wanted to put it up here because it shows you the diversity of the various asylum regimes and the policies in the various member states. And you can see that it ranges not only from how many applicants each country gets here, or the percentage that is being accepted in one country versus another, which again, think about the open Schengen area that may lead some asylum seekers to seek asylum in one country if they can, so, as opposed to another one. But also it tells you something about the, some of the benefits, the material benefits, which have been in many, most countries drastically reduced, um, and also the, the minimum wait time before they are permitted to work. And that is obviously very important because, um, you know, um, Asylum seekers do not want to hang around in what, whichever camps they are being held. They want to be productive and they want to actually be able to feed their families and have that kind of sovereignty, autonomy. Now I'm just going to finish up with some of the EU approaches, in particular the EU issues to refugee management. These are the headlines are taken from the European Union website, but I filled in sort of uh, some of the concrete policies and also a little bit of my commentary, my analytical commentary. Now, one thing that was mentioned by um, Professor Abraham is the revision of the Dublin system, where the one where the first country processes the asylum. Obviously, that has led to the border states of the Schengen area being particularly affected. Right now, that is, again, Greece and Italy, and we see some of the political consequences of that already. Um, however, the revision of the Dublin system, whereby the first country of entry is supposed to process the asylum is quite difficult because what is the alternative? And the European Commission, again the EU's executive, has have asked for the reform of that asylum um, for the Dublin regulation for a long time now. It has been stalled for years because pretty much an alternative would be that there is some sort of proportional distribution system in the EU. But uh, many countries do not want that. In particular, in fact, um, Austria and no, not Austria. Sorry, Hungary and Poland have have been cited in front of the European Court of Justice because they have vehemently denied taking in any of the, the asylum seekers that would have been redistributed that way. Um, the Czech Republic has taken in 12 out of you know, the millions that arrived, right? Compared to, the, to Germany's um, over 1 million. So that is an ongoing problem. And in fact, today at the European Council meeting, um, the, the, that topic is again on the agenda, next to Brexit, of course. Um, sharing responsibility between EU member states and aiding those. Again, going back to that, it's financially and as well as logistically difficult. There are definitely distribution is issues. During the height of the refugee crisis, um, an attempt was being made, or at least on paper, to redistribute 160,000 of the refugees. In practice, only 30,000 have, have been redistributed to the countries that wanted to take them in, uh, up with a in financial incentive of up to 10,000 um, euros. That should be done. Not should not be dollars, um, but that has obviously not motivated motivated specific countries to take in more. So there's really a disunity among states how to handle the crisis and how to reform that the Dublin Agreement. There is of course the West European states, with, which have historically a much longer experience with the, the sort of kind of migration post -war, World War II versus the East European states. There's also the issue of the entry states on the Southern Mediterranean shores versus the ones the transit countries versus the reception countries. Think of for example, um, Sweden or Britain, which in where the Leave campaign was uh, working quite heavily with some of these xenophobic um, uh, discourses. So the EU budget um, from 2014 to 2020, um, that's the one that is, um, has more than doubled the aid. Um, and in the future budget 2020 to 2027, the the funding to solve and to assist member state has again been increased. And that is with the official names of the funds are the Asylum, AMF, Asylum Migration Integration Fund and the International Security Fund, or Internal Security Fund, I should say. Um, but here also becomes clear, if you look at the chart at the pie, that um, the border management takes over any sort of integration um, policies.
securing external borders. Now here you probably all have heard about the EU's Frontex agency, that's the external border agency that is patrolling the Mediterranean and here again, um, particularly with Re Reformant, um, there are some international legal um, processes that are um, quite heavily debated because um, if an asylum seeker can actually not apply for asylum, right, that would be uh, contrary to international law and um, whereas in the European Union there was an initial attempt to have to actually rescue um, would-be migrants on the Mediterranean Sea that has become much more uh, harder to sustain. Um, for example, Italy has made a really 180 degree change from um, f first picking up uh, refugees to now kind of trying to keep them out. Um, that is really problematic. And so with that, the EU External Border Agency has been propped up quite significantly. Its budget has grown tremendously compared to others. Um, we have now the establishment of a European border guard that is also um, um, being there to kind of uh, patrol together with uh, national um, uh, with national administrators the Mediterranean seas. There's also a contentious EU-Turkey deal which you may have heard about, a sort of a swap, refugee swap deal that has all kinds of implications that I cannot go into um, because of the time. Um, suggestions are also to create external hotspots. So basically the, the, the asylum processing will occur outside of the European Union, which you can imagine according to international law, that is also problematic in its own right, right? Um, readmission agreements, meaning the agreements that um, um, certain um, asylum seekers, if they would, if their claims would be denied, they can be returned to safe countries. There is a safe country list, but each EU member state has a different safe country list. And some of those countries that the EU has even readmission agreements aren't really not considered safe. I wouldn't consider Egypt safe, for example, right? In which right now the talks are going on to, to establish a readmission agreement. Um, so more collaboration on apprehending and prosecuting traffickers is probably also one of the more constructive ways uh, in trying to cut down on that um, human trafficking business. Fostering refugees integration in Europe. I think um, Consul General Klein will say more about this, but in generally, of course, there's also financial lines, uh, the European Social as well as the Regional Development Fund. Their early work permits would certainly help, though again, the member states are in charge of that. Uh, labor integration obviously is very important, as well as civil society. And uh, Germany has done really a great job in involving civil society, but it also cannot be just native civil society. There has to be sort of what's called um, in social sociological parlance bridging, sort of, you know, that um, um, not only native EU civil society groups are being involved, that they also self-help groups from the refugee populations themselves, that they are getting better um, involved into the integration business. And lastly, the preventing the need to seek refuge or to migrate. Um, and if you look at sort of um, the amount, two billion is really nothing <laughs> compared for 26 member states in sub-Saharan Africa, is nothing compared to the money that's spent on internal security of the European Union area. Um, development aid can contribute there a lot too. So basically there has been an acknowledgement that the European Union has to do more to enable folks to remain in their countries rather than to seek a better lot someplace else. But um, there's, uh, if you look at EU foreign policy, there has been often a trade-off in which political stability by certain regimes, be it Libya or Egypt have been, or Morocco nowadays, have been um, received preference over some sort of democracy and human rights pr promotion. Um, with that being said, I think I just leave it. Consul General Klein from the German consulate to talk about Germany's experiences. First of all, of course, I'd like to thank Louise for setting up this impressive panel. And I really appreciated all the uh, presentations we heard so far. I'm expecting the one of Janine, of course, to be at the same level. And I'm very, very impressed with the audience. Uh, being a non-native speaker, uh, I would have been hard put to follow the presentations because without prior knowledge, I had a problem getting along, talking, uh, them talking so fast. So mm -hmm. as I can't help it, I hope I'll win you over by talking a bit more slowly and um, focusing very much on Germany just as the program wants me to. And um, 
I think without being repetitive, I can sum things up and then um, go into how Germany is trying to better integrate the refugees. Now, some of the background um, that uh, Mr. Thiel has just mentioned can be summed up in that simple picture of two concentric circles. Now, the outline of the bigger circle are the borders of the European Union, of the Schengen parties, and a very small concentric cir circle in the middle is to symbolize Germany. And theoretically, everybody who wants to get into the EU has to get over that outer concentric cir circle and then, without any further ado, can make his or her way uh, to the smaller circle, that being Germany. Germany would just check their airports, for example, because, well, you can still fly into Germany directly from third countries that are not member states of the EU and members of the Schengen Agreement. Thus, Germany, at that point in time, we're talking about 2015, did not have any border installations because we don't need them. Others do that job for us. Now, um, two of these other countries, Italy and Greece, were challenged by that. I mean, Italy looks a lot like Florida, meaning it has a huge coastline. And while Greece does not really look like Florida, it has lots and lots and lots and even more islands and thus an enormous coastline that nobody is able to effectively guard. Meaning, when things hit the fan in uh, the Middle East, people could make it uh, through different routes um, to Greece and Italy. And it was simply overload. It was impossible, um, even the best willing couldn't have processed all the arrivals. I'll make a slight hiatus here because I will really concentrate on the refugees because asylum seekers and economic migrants in Germany are treated under different um, uh, laws and would require a different presentation and that's just too much for this meeting. We're talking about what, is or what caused the ruckus in um, Europe and in Germany, and these were mostly refugees. What was that ruckus about? The situation in Syria, in Iraq, and Afghanistan for quite some time already um, caused uh, many people to come to Germany, who in theory, being refugees, Geneva Convention, would return eventually, when the situation that is life-threatening in their country uh, would um, have dissolved. When they arrived, mostly in Greece in that case, um, it was still summer. Now, in autumn, in October, when the weather had already turned pretty bad, even for Europe at that time, it was raining a lot, we still had um, about 800,000 people stuck in camps in Greece, mostly, who were just in dire straits. There was no way to house them adequately, no way to process them adequately. And that was the moment when um, uh, Miss Merkel pronounced those well-known words, wir schaffen das, we can do that. And uh, despite Germany theoretically not being in the front line for receiving um, refugees, they were allowed passage to Germany. Now, it gets even more complicated because Germany has a federal level, but many um, competences are um, dealt with at the lender level, which would be the state level in uh, the United States. There are two situations that came together for the absolute majority of Germans at that time. 
appreciating and welcoming the decision of Mrs. Merkel. And still, the majority in Germany is behind her on this, regarding the reception of uh, the refugees, not always um, regarding um, how these refugees were processed. Now, the processing obviously was a problem. I already mentioned there were no border installations. There were also no preparations prior to Wir schaffen das uh, to receive and process these refugees. That was organized in a very fast manner and it worked okay by many standards, but uh, by German standards it was slightly chaotic. I think other countries may have been pretty pleased with themselves, but um, we had hoped to do it even better. Uh, but then came two um, phenomena together that, as I said, cause that Germans are still behind um, Ms. Merkel's decision. The first one was an experience after the Second World War. Prior to the Second World War, there were a number of German-speaking groups in many uh, European countries uh, who had lived there for centuries. They had been called by uh, prior rulers to come in and farm in these regions. But after the Second World War, they were no longer welcomed. And they returned to the only country that um, they felt somehow related to, Germany. So after the Second World War, uh, particularly the Federal Republic of Germany, West Germany at that time, the three um, allied zones of Germany, accepted 12 million um, German refugees. And um, that was about 25% of the people then there. So in a war, in a destroyed country, this is uh, a feat to integrate this number of people, but of course they marry, and thus many families have a history of, um, of refugees. They know what it is to be a refugee. They have understanding for these people. This was one element. The next element, and it has already been mentioned before today, was that in the late 50s, in the 60s, um, Germany invited many Turkish people to come to Germany to work there and had expected them to return to Turkey eventually and after having made enough money. That did not happen. But because it had been expected that they would leave again, and rather soon, um, they had not been prepared for what they expected, uh, what expected them in Germany, how Germany works, how Germans feel and um, how our society, um, um, the values of our societies, our ways in Germany. And we tried to take these two lessons to work out a better way to help the newcomers, the refugees, to integrate themselves. So they receive a lot more German classes, German instructions, information on Germany, Germany's constitution, uh, uh, Germany's culture, and um, they try to help people to uh, get on a fast track into a more stable and a more self-controlled life. So you will get classes with specific business needs in mind, classes that prepare you for university studies, if you perhaps already have some degree of university study, they will try to get you the documentation or um, uh, equivalent of an uh, um, documentation of courses you have already taken or skills and qualifications you have already acquired before coming to Germany. Um, we have a nice German word that's Leitkultur. They get information on our guiding culture, how we Germans feel life should be and we should treat each other. 
um, they came up with all kinds of electronic gadgets that help people through everyday life. Yes, there is a, an app uncommon arrival that'll tell you about German authorities and schools and language courses so that uh, you can sit down and quietly check it out without nobody harassing you or pushing you in a line. They have special interest classes like in, for example for people with prior knowledge in IT and um, uh, they have um, kindergartens and preschools for um, uh, children so that they can uh, acquire German skills faster and as has already been pointed out uh, a lot of volunteer work to help people. Uh, seniors volunteered, uh, you had a lot of teachers who volunteered to not only teach um, uh, classes but also to help uh, refugees um, uh, go to German authorities and assist them in, um, in getting what is due to them, which um, covers a wide range of services. I think I'll leave it at that, because many details have been presented very ably by, my pre well, by the speakers before me, and I think we have another um, presentation to come. Uh, I'll leave more to your questions and answers. I appreciate your attention and I, I'll just give us a few minutes to get back onto the schedule. Thank you. Final speaker Jamie Everett will talk about uh, efforts here in Miami to help Syrians who have arrived. Hi, good evening. Um, so my name is Jamie. I work for a newly established local nonprofit, and we work with underserved refugees here in South Florida. We're called Refugee Assistance Alliance, and um, our mission is to help displaced persons lacking a support network navigate life in the United States, and we do this primarily through in-home tutoring and homework assistance for children. We have other programs too, I'll mention those. Um, but one of the main things I wanted to mention is that since we are a new nonprofit and since the people that we work with change, we often have to think through what we're doing and evolve our programming to meet their needs. So that's one of the things that we're trying to work through with our board of directors is learning how to evolve and meet the needs of our families and continue our programming and our mission. Um, our vision will always remain the same though. It's that we will have a society where all displaced persons are warm, warmly welcomed um, as they work towards self-sufficiency and full integration. So our focus right now is on newly arrived um, refugees, mainly from Syria, just because of the geopolitical reasons why we have Syrians here. And we work with people who don't speak English or Spanish. So it's not to suggest that refugees that come from Spanish-speaking countries don't have issues and don't need assistance, but it's to suggest that if you think from a very practical level, an Arabic-speaking family, a Muslim-Arabic-speaking family, all of our Arabic-speaking families happen to be Muslim, um, what are the needs and the challenges that they're going to have given that they speak Arabic? So when they try to go see a doctor, you can probably find a doctor in Spanish, very hard to find an Arabic speaking doctor. Your children's forms that come home from school in Miami-Dade or in Broward, you can get them in Spanish. In fact, all of my son's forms come in English and Spanish. And if you contact the school, you can get them in Creole. But there are two Arabic translators in all of the Miami-Dade system, and you have to contact them on an individualized basis. So all these forms that come home to the refugee moms in our program, they don't know what to do with them, and they need help. Um, and your insurance, imagine it's hard enough for us to deal with our health insurance or our home insurance or our car insurance on the phone. And speaking on the phone as a person who's learned an, a second language as an adult, it's a very hard thing to do. So for them in Arabic, talking about insurance, that's not something that's easy for them. So while we tend to send our volunteers in as English tutors, what they often become are friends of the family and mentors that work through very basic needs. 
This is what our website looks like currently on the front page. Um, right now we have 17 families in our program, 15 of whom are Syrian. We have one Ethiopian family and one Iraqi family. I got a contact today for a Russian family that wants to join our program. Um, we are normally referred to by other organizations. So example, for example, the Florida Department of um, Torture, or the, they help with people who've been tortured. They contact us and they refer people to us. Our families have, yeah, sorry. <laughs> our, our, families, our families have been through, yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, our families have, have been through quite a lot, many of them, and so they come to us through referrals. Um, we also have been told that we are likely going to get Rohingya families, um, so that's from Myanmar. Um, so the needs that we have established based on listening to the families in our program, they want to learn English in their homes. This um, has come up mainly because we have a lot of conservative Muslims <clears throat> in our organization right now. <clears throat> and many of the women are uncomfortable either driving, attending a class taught by a man, attending a class with men in the class. So the degree to which they assimilate and the, the speed with which they assimilate is not up to us. It, it's up to us to meet them where they're at and try to help them on that path. So instead of saying, hey, you know, this is an option and it's free at Miami-Dade College, you need to do this now, we go into their homes and we befriend them and we work with them. And the idea is that within 12 months, our English tutors will have given them basic survival English so that they feel comfortable enough to enroll in a more intensive English language program. We know that they're not going to learn English from us for a couple hours a week. Um, uh, navigating their basic needs, like I mentioned before, and our tutors are constantly getting back to us and telling us, I went to this home and there's this issue now. So where do we turn? What do we do? Uh, what happens if we find domestic violence? Where do we go? This is beyond, all these issues put together are beyond my scope. We have some volunteers who are experts in particular areas, but in general, our needs are, are huge. Um, so we're trying to navigate those. Most of the women in our program want to contribute financially to their family in some way. So we take that into account. Um, and then just basic integrating into the community. That's another need that they have and that they want, not always to the same degree, depending on who you're talking to, but most of them want to integrate. Um, so the response from Refugee Assistance Alliance is this in-home individualized tutoring and mentorship. And we often tell our volunteers when we're training them, we don't know exactly what you're going to see. We don't know exactly what the needs are going to be. So you are there as someone who is befriending them and introducing your family to them. And then hopefully over time, they will open up to you enough and you will understand their struggles. And then we can either help them ourselves or we can learn where to point them for help. Um, a Taste of Syria, many of you have probably heard of the supper clubs or the Syrian supper clubs around here. OK, so the supper clubs were started with another organization who has since passed them on to another organization who passed them on to us. They are notoriously difficult to run, but they are wonderful. What happens is that the Syrian women cook for an event that you either buy tickets to or maybe you would attend at a synagogue. Um, we just did an event over at, the, it was an interfaith event over at the Coral Gables Congregational Church. So our women will cook and they're paid a very good rate that's about four times what, you know, a local rate would be um, for a new vendor. And oftentimes they attend and sometimes they speak. We think this is good for community relations, for cross-cultural understanding, for peace building. So we try to pursue this even though it's not really initially what our programming was about. Um, and then, so a help desk, this is our way of trying to, and we think we're going to call it a referral system instead of a help desk, because this makes you think of IT. But um, so all of these needs that our tutors have, what we need to do is put them in one easily accessible place online so that our volunteers can go there, and maybe in the future even our families, when their English gets good enough, go there and look up their needs by category, and then be directed to specialists, maybe even specific contacts, organizations, nonprofits in the South Florida area where they can turn. And actually, Claire's class of interns is going to help us with that in this spring semester. So that's wonderful. Um, so the goal for the families in our organization is self-sufficiency and to be fully participatory in the community. 
Um, our families are not a monolith. They have different goals. They have different hardships. But for most of them, some definition of self-sufficiency and becoming fully participatory um, is important to them. We have a lot of challenges um, for anyone who's worked in a nonprofit, particularly a cross-cultural setting, um, nonprofit or academic cross-cultural setting, um, navigating cross-cultural issues is a daily challenge. Uh, we spend a lot of time talking about the issues that we come across as we try to help the people. Um, for example, the high value that we would place on learning English and on educating the next generation is not necessarily a value that our families would have. One example of that, we have one amazing tutor who worked with one of the children, um, his name is Sultan, to get into Breakthrough Miami. And most of you are familiar with Breakthrough, of Miami, Breakthrough Miami, I'm sure, but it's an educational organization for underprivileged kids, and they have an incredibly high college success rate. And so if you can get the child into Breakthrough Miami, the future for them is incredible. But as you can imagine, trying to explain this to a family from Syria or a family from Iraq who may not necessarily think of their child in that way or really feel like that is one of their needs, their most precious needs at this time, might not be education. Um, so explaining what that means and working through the paperwork and going to the meetings, it's difficult. So we have to constantly try to balance what we think they should do with an effort to really listen to them and hear what their struggles are so that we are helping them become more assimilated into the culture that they're going to be staying in without in any way being paternalistic. They deal with a lot of stigmatization. Um, and whatever issues they deal with, we also deal with, um, not only because we care about them, but because it gets back to us and they ask us to figure it out. One of the recent issues that we heard about is the stigmatization that comes along with the word refugee. Some of our families are still refugees. Some of them have green cards. They don't want to be termed refugees anymore. They're very proud of becoming citizens if they have become citizens. And they have a hard time with their children going to school and dealing with any stigmatization of being a refugee. Um, so we try to work with them through that and explain to them what it means to someone like me when I hear the word refugee or a donor when they hear the word refugee. Um, but that doesn't always help. And they've also come, they've run across xenophobia and racism. Um, not everyone has as progressive of an outlook on the other as the people in this room probably do. So some of the things that they deal with are really difficult, especially with their kids. Um, determining needs priority. This is always something that they're dealing with and we're dealing with. If we show up, if we send a tutor to their home or, or I go in for a meeting with a woman and I show up and I say, you know, I'm here today to work on this, or the tutor says, I'm here today to work on verbs, and they say, well, my husband has cancer, but our insurance just fell through and we don't know how to deal with it. We're going to get on the phone and work through that. Um, empowerment versus creating dependency. So we believe as an organization in empowering women financially. We believe in putting money in the hands of women so that they can assist their families and their children. But we also don't want to give them an unrealistic view of how much you can get paid for cooking or that cooking is, we don't want to give the impression that cooking is the only thing that they could do if there's something else that they want to do. So while trying to value what their skills are and empower them, we also have to be careful with what's reality because when they're done with our organization, they're in the real work world. And then of course, setting boundaries. Um, just as a nonprofit field worker, it's tough. You get texts at 11 at night, and someone's telling you their baby no longer fits in their crib and cries all night, and can you help them find a new crib? And that's not even what we do. But then that is what we do the next day. And it's a privilege to do this job, but we all have to come together um, as staff and as board members and talk about how to set boundaries when you're working with people that you really care about. So that's it. If you have any questions or you would like to hear more about our organization or volunteer, you can always speak with me afterwards. Thank you. Thank you.
you very much. We've obviously heard a whole bunch from high level legal technicalities to everyday practicalities. And I think the challenge of integrating immigrants and refugees and asylum seekers contains all of those elements. And so I'm very thankful to our panelists who come at this question from really different angles, from really different places, and I hope have given us a full picture, or at least part of a full picture, about what's going on. I think we're a small enough group that in the interest of time, I'm actually going to dispense with the Q&A in a formal way. But we have an open bar, and we have a lot of food, and all of our panelists are going to be here. and. The the second part of this event is really a networking reception in the idea that we talked about earlier, this idea of building bridges, getting people to know each other who maybe have never met before. So not only would I encourage you to talk to the panelists afterwards, but talk to somebody that you don't know in this room and find out why they came and what you have in common um, and what kind of connections you might be able to forge. Um, but before I let you go, I have a uh, four announcements. One announcement is that everybody has on their chair a comment card. Um, I would greatly appreciate knowing how you found out about this event so we know how to advertise the next one. I'm also a professor, so I want to know what it is that you learned. So I would be very thankful if you could write down at least one new thing that you learned tonight. And if you would, if you put your cards, we have a little bin for them on the way back out. Um, the second announcement that I want to make is that the next roundtable in this series will be taking place at FIU on November 15th at 7 p.m. and we'll be talking about changing gender and sexuality roles and public policies around those issues in the two countries. And of course, you're all herzlich willkommen to attend those events. Um, and while we're enjoying our food and drink, uh, the next part of the program will be we have two students who I believe are waiting outside, um, a violinist and a cellist, to come play some Beethoven's music for us. So um, you can all give them a thank you on your way out. So thank you all to attending, and please come up and talk to us and enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you very much. <laughs>